Good evening, everybody. I hope um, everybody's having a good day. And um, I am uh, Dr. Elizabeth Taylor. Um, I am one of the surgeons at uh, Points East Veterinary Specialty Hospital. Uh, so I welcome you to this talk um, by Dr. S Saker. She's an associate professor of nutrition, a director of the nutrition program, and service chief of the Health and Wellness Center at the NC State College of Veterinary Medicine. She received her master's in animal nutrition from Clemson and her doctor of veterinary medicine from the University of Georgia. Uh, following five years of doing mixed animal practice, she completed a PhD in nutrition and clinical and a clinical nutrition residency regional college of veterinary medicine. She also spent 12 years there as a clinical nutritionist and research professor before moving to North Carolina to initiate the veterinary nutrition at, uh, at, this, at NC State in 2007. She currently divides her time between clinical work, teaching, running a clinical nutrition training program, and pursuing research interests focused on nutrition for health and disease. This evening, Dr. Saker will be presenting the challenge one patient, multiple disease conditions, and on a diet focus. So welcome, Dr. Saker. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Taylor. Uh... Oh, and I totally forgot, <laughs> but um, okay. I, will be, I will be doing the um, September CE. Um, so we are gonna pull the audience uh, in terms of what you guys would like to have a little bit more information on. Um, and so if you guys could just pay close attention for a minute um, before Dr. Saker talks, takes over, um, but what would you guys most be most interested in learning? So number one would be bandaging, when to wrap it up and tips for success. Two, uh, canine hind limb lameness, what to consider when it's not a cranial cruciate ligament tear. Uh, number three, mast cell tumor surgical management considerations. And number four, fractures. Not all things are divided equally. All right. Looks like people want to know when it's not cruciate ligament. Um, so we'll, I'll develop a talk for that and then I'll see you guys in September. But um, a very warm welcome to Dr. Saker and you could take it away. See if we can move forward here. Thank you again, Dr. Taylor, for that um, that really nice uh, introduction. And thank you, Vets Pets, for um, for giving me the opportunity to talk with um, talk with your vets uh, about this topic. And so I'd I'd like to actually start the topic by just asking. Um, a question, and I think I believe it's a polling question. And the first one is: um, um, Are you truly comfortable with making an appropriate um, diet choice for a patient with more than two health concerns? I'm really curious to um, to see what the audience feels about that. You could go ahead and just submit your answer. No, okay, all right. Well, um, majority of no. I'm glad that there's some of you, about 30% who feel pretty comfortable with that. Uh, I wanna follow that question up with the next one, which is coming up any second now. Um, so now I'm asking, are you truly comfortable making appropriate diet choices for a patient that has three or more health concerns? Okay, that, um, <laughs> that certainly increased the, the discomfort level um, here. And um, thank you so much for, um, for sharing those responses. And um, so my, my goal here today is to, to help you with this challenge, to help you feel more comfortable with this. And let's see if I can get my... There we go. So, um, so again, the goals for this session are to 
familiarize you with the process of diet choice for multiple health concerns. And I, I want to emphasize the word process because I think if you can get a handle on this on the process that uh, that I think is easy for make it easier for you to come up with those diet choices in a short window of time. Um, once you're familiarize yourself with this process, which you're going to go through, then to consider um, the best case scenario in terms of diet choices and what your patient is presenting as versus when you need to compromise and, and or prioritize um, disease conditions and diet choices. And um, hopefully another goal would be to identify your diet nutrient disease state go-to resources. Certainly, um, I appreciate that you have many, many other um, patient concerns in the course of a day, in the course of a case, and, um, and certainly um, the nutrient aspect of it is likely not on the tip of your tongue. And so what kind of resources are there that you can go to easily for this? And finally, I'd like to just uh, give us a chance to practice um, some cases with multiple disease conditions so that hopefully you feel a little bit more comfortable um, and are able to um, try this on your own with some success. So um, as you see the picture below, um, I'm here to help you with that challenge. Okay, so um, I'd like to, before we get started, the first thing I want to do is basically set the stage. And I want to set the stage by saying that um, what we want to do here is the ultimate goal is to choose the best diet for your patient. And it's pretty easy when you have one condition um, or even, you know, even if you're dealing with a healthy life stage pet, um, choosing, choosing an appropriate diet is, is pretty easy these days. You know, the life stage diets are listed as life stage. The single disease diets are, um, are pretty easy to figure out in terms of utilizing your product reference guides and following the index and sometimes even just going by the name or the letters. But um, when we have multiple conditions going on at one time, in order to choose the best diet, there's a couple of things that we need to consider. First is um, taking into consideration the patient's age, their gender, obviously their breed and species, canine versus um, versus feline, and their general state um, in terms of, are they healthy pets? Do they have a disease condition or disease conditions? Um, next, we want to identify or list the major clinical, environmental, behavioral, and feeding approach concerns for these patients. Um, it helps to be able to consider the specific nutrient focus for signalment or these, or these major concerns. And just a quick example of that would be, for an example, a major nutrient focus for um, easy growing puppy would be protein, calcium, and phosphorus, okay? Uh, another example would be a major health concern, um, a nutrient focus for um, renal disease would be lowering the phosphorus level in the diet. Um, if we had a senior patient, uh, maybe a nutrient, a special nutrient focus might be high diet, high, higher diet digestibility or adjusting the, the, um, the protein level for that patient. So that's, that's what I'm talking about when I, when I mentioned that aspect. And then finally, uh, I want, uh, we need to be able to utilize available resources um, to appropriately choose diet options. And here, you know, there's, there's a number of resources available. I have provided some that, um, that you have access to. Uh, hopefully you'll find them helpful and we'll utilize those in today's talk so you can get an idea of, you know, how, how to best use them. Other references uh, or resources would be your product reference guides. If you have pet food representatives that in non-COVID times come to your clinic and talk to you about diets or you Zoom with right now about diets, they can help. Um, you can contact individuals like myself, um, a vet clinical nutritionist, um, uh, to, uh, to get guidelines as well. Certainly, I'm not the only one. Um, and there are a number of schools across the country that have vet nutri clinical nutritionists, as well as some individual um, people who do consulting work. If you want a list of those, just FYI, if you get on the ACVN listserv, they would have a list of individuals like myself that you could utilize as resources. Okay, so um, if we go back to our goals uh, and the idea of we want to choose the best diet, 
and we have multiple problems going on, there are, let's, let's start with the best case scenario, okay? The best case scenario would be when you have multiple disease states or medical concerns that have similar nutrients of interest or nutrients of concern for the patient and similar or identical key diet characteristics. And when I talk about diet characteristics, when I mention that, what I mean is, you know, like say high digestibility, low diet digestibility, <clears throat> um, dry food, canned food, liquid diet, things like that. All right, so, so um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, like I said, the nutrients of concern would be similar, identical, and um, your diet options would fit or best meet the nutritional needs of animal for um, across the disease states or medical conditions. I wanna give you um, an example of that, of those in just a second. <clears throat> but when you can have the best case scenario, excuse me, it's really great because then you don't have to prioritize in terms of medical conditions. And you don't have to compromise in regards to choosing a diet that um, might not be best for everything, okay? So again, my examples uh, here would be, if you have a growing pet that unfortunately had fractures from a trauma, uh, another example of best, scenario, best case scenario would be when you have an animal with cardiac and renal disease. And please don't get me wrong, I don't mean like it's a really good scenario for a pet to have, these problem, multiple problems, I mean from the perspective of choosing a diet um, that these, these concerns have identical or very, very similar nutrient needs. And so that's what I mean by best case scenario. So it's easier to pick a diet. Another example would be obesity and pancreatitis. And, an, and another common example would be renal disease and hepatic disease when the patient had uh, encep hepatic encephalopathic um, uh, clinical signs. So I just take this a step further, these examples. Um, what do I really mean by, or what do I mean to me by having similar nutrients of concern? Well, if we go back to our growing pet with fractures. We know that the growing animal has a higher requirement for protein, calcium, and phosphorus than if it was an adult maintenance pet. Uh, as well, we know that when we have fractures and we need to have tissue and bone healing, that nutrients of concern for those are increased protein, increased calcium, and increased phosphorus. So it's a great fit for choosing a diet. Uh, obesity and pancreatitis, we can, we can narrow that down to just low fat. So choosing, looking for low fat diets. Cardiac and renal disease example would be many cardiac disease states <coughs> me, require low sodium diets or sodium restriction. If we have a uh, renal patient that's hypertensive, that also would require or indicates uh, a diet for uh, sodium restriction. <coughs> Both of them will need adjusted protein, um, possibly adjusting the potassium um, and increased omega-3 fatty acids. And finally, the last example was just um, where I have cardiac, I'm sorry, where I have a uh, CKD and uh, later stages, three to four, uh, as well as uh, encephalopathic um, uh, issue with, with uh, liver disease. And so in those cases, we need uh, lower protein for both, both situations. We need lower sodium for both situations. Um, we need the increased soluble fiber to help manage that protein that's not being able to be uh, utilized and absorbed. And finally, lower phosphorus one for the renal issue, and then the lower phosphorus will come along for the hepatic one when we have lower protein diets. So again, examples of best case scenario, and, um, and this is when, um, when it may, life is easier, okay? Unfortunately, um, much of the time, our identified um, key nutritional concerns, key nutrients of concern are not similar, nor are they identical across disease states or medical concerns. When that's the case, um, after we, we can do a, a, you know, a complete, um, a comprehensive animal assessment, and then we'll likely, very likely have to prioritize which disease states are higher ranked than others for that animal in the short term. And we'll likely have to compromise uh, on what would be the absolute best diet choice for this animal. Um, again, prioritizing what's the most, excuse me, what's the most life-threatening 
and, um, and then choosing nutritional intervention to help mitigate those adverse clinical signs. And generally when they come in into the hospital, um, they're, they're coming in for a, if they're disease state, usually a flare up of some or a new um, presentation of clinical signs. And so we're more concerned when they're hospitalized or just when they first are discharged for short-term diet choices and our long-term ones may be a little bit different for these patients. Once we get one or two of those um, comorbidities under control. Okay, so um, let's go through a case together that will allow us to go through the process, okay? And so this first case is Savory. Savory is a seven-year-old um, male castrated mixed breed dog. Uh, Savory weighs about 3.9, I'm sorry, 9.3 kilograms, is a little bit over-conditioned and a little shy on muscling. Um, he's been inappetent for a week. He's been exhibiting signs of labored breathing, exercise intolerance, lethargy. This is quite unusual for Savory because he's generally a, quite a spunky little fellow. Um, I'm not throwing out all of the history for you, but I'm summarizing um, the clinical concerns based on the clinical history, the current physical exam findings, and the laboratory diagnostic um, results. So what we have here for Savory is that um, he, he, has, he was diagnosed several years ago as a diabetic and he's been well managed for the past two years. Um, he recent, the recent findings are congestive heart failure with hypertension um, and calcium oxalate stones in his bladder. And also uh, he's had pancreatic episodes of pancreatitis um, about one a year over the last three years. And mostly those seem to be associated with uh, dietary indiscretion. Some additional information about savory that might help when we come to actual diet choices or diet forms or characteristics would be, he really has a preference for canned food over a kibble form of food. Um, right now to help manage his diabetes, uh, he's fed Royal Canin Glycobalance and Royal Canin Glycobalance, if you're unfamiliar with that, is, is the Royal Canin prescription canine diet that's formulated for the management of diabetes. Um, he is quite pampered. He's the only pet in the household and his owners um, are willing to do whatever they, whatever you recommend for him um, as the best option. So that's always, always nice to work with this kind of clients, it makes life a little bit easier, right? All right, so back to Savory. Um, the assessment for this animal uh, gives us a, a list of major clinical concerns. And so that's part of the process, right? Assessing the animal to find out what all is going on and um, come up with a list of major clinical concerns. And here we have congestive heart failure, diabetes mellitus, historical pancreatitis, calcium oxalate bladder stones, and um, this pet is a little bit overweight. Okay, so the next part of the process is um, we're gonna need to likely prioritize. So from that list, we wanna try and prioritize the most critical medical concerns or rank them, the highest concern in terms of um, short-term adverse concern, medical concerns to the patient to the lowest one. Um, while he's hospitalized in short term. Again, that may change once he's recovering, discharged, and, and at home feeding long term, might, those, those um, prioritizations might change. So my first question to you guys as a group is, what would be the top priority clinical concern uh, in the short term for savory? And I am not quite sure how this, this particular question and answer scenario will work. Um, Maybe uh, Dr. Taylor can help me out, or is it just kind of they think about it and um, can they write in the chat or how does that work? My they can enter their uh, enter it through the chat. Okay. All right. All right, well, I'm not really seeing any responses yet. I think 
Tak. Oh, we have two. One more. Let's see what we have. All right, we have several. Okay, let's see what we have here. Um, we have heart failure, pancreatitis, then diabetes, heart failure, glucose control, short-term concern is heart disease, heart, heart, heart. Okay, so um, thank you for your responses. Uh, and um, it seems like the majority of you are feeling that the heart issue could be the top priority concern, clinical concern for savory in the short term. And I just wanna share, um, I, I would agree with that. Um, so congestive heart failure, I put as, as, our, as my top priority in terms of choosing a diet, a, a best fit diet for this patient. Um, and I chose that based on what I thought was short term, the most life threatening for savory, okay? Um, the next column over, I actually have a list of um, a list of nutrients of concern associated with congestive heart failure, and uh, you can see that the list is is kind of long. Um, do I expect you as um, you know? Do I expect the the clinicians to be able to remember all this every day? No, um, but I just put these up there for you to see what kind of list we have um, after congestive heart failure. I was concerned next about uh, diabetes in terms of maintaining good glucose control, uh, not necessarily in the short term because the animals in the hospital and I could use um, insulin CRI if I needed to, but hopefully that was, wouldn't be the case. And then uh, after that, I put um, calcium oxalate third on my list and then historical pancreatitis last. And the reason I put historical pancreatitis last even though it's one of the easiest ones to uh, choose a dietary intervention for is because I got the impression that this pancreatitis was really due to bouts of or episodes of dietary indiscretion for this patient. Um, and so again, for each of these clinical concerns uh, based on, um, this is my ranking based on the size of the star. And then I've listed some nutrients of, of concern that I want to think about for um, the diet. I did not rank the fact that the animal is overweight because that's not something I would want to mess with, so to speak, um, while they're recovering from um, critical um, issues, medical concerns. Okay, so um, when you get a case like this, part of the process is to say, okay, is there for these top clinical concerns, and even the most, the one that you put number one, is there at least one nutrient that you can think of that you remember from um, your courses in vet school or whatever that is, um, is important, that really kind of, kind of sits with you um, and uh, it's kind of nagging thing in the back of your head? Uh, mine would be sodium for congestive heart failure. Even though these other nutrients of concern are important, I think that sodium restriction is going to be number one for um, for this dog for congestive heart failure. When I think about a dog with diabetes, um, I think about the management of glucose control through diet, of course, and insulin. And, um, and the best way to do that is to make sure that we have a, a fairly large proportion of complex carbohydrates in their diet as compared to the type of carbohydrates that are quickly um, digestible into uh, releasing glucose. And pancreatitis, of course, would be fat. And then um, calcium oxalate, interestingly, and I'm hoping that everyone uh, will agree with this, um, that water is really the most important nutrient for calcium oxalate management um, uh, for these patients to try and keep the urine as dilute as possible. So, so basically, you know, there's a list from a nutritionist perspective, there's a, a pretty large list or, you know, for, for these concerns, but if you can just pick the top one, um, then that's a good start, right? Then after you have that, um, I'm gonna, I, I provided these um, tables, several tables for you. And this is um, one that hopefully you'll find beneficial. And so I'm gonna go back in this slide for just a second. You can see from my top concern that I wanted there to be, wanted savory to have a restricted sodium diet. 
Um, and um, if I go down my congestive heart failure list, I also um, want it to have some other characteristics, okay? So if I, because it's a restricted nutrient, I'm giving you this, this table and on the top of the table, um, it basically it's a list of nutrient restricted diet options, okay? And so at the, the top um, is um, some specific nutrients that are important in disease states in regards to being restricted to help mitigate clinical signs. So I have sodium, phosphorus, calcium, magnesium, protein, fat, and soluble carbohydrates. And then on the vertical axis, you can see these, um, the diet categories um, and sometimes a specific diet within those categories. And so for the cardiac issues, um, I would like um, the cardiac diets are sodium restricted, which is great. They're also phosphorus restricted. Uh, and some of them, at least one of them, there's really only two, is protein restricted, okay? So, so that's the cardiac issue. I also indicated that, um, we indicated that diabetes and calcium oxalate were concerns for savory. And so if we look at the list of nutrient restrictions for those um, diet categories or those disorders, you can see that um, for, um, for stones that, the only one that's really restricted is, uh, is Hill CD, which is a multi-care stone diet. And then um, certainly we want these diets to be um, restricted um, in phosphorus. I'm sorry, there should be a phosphorus magnesium um, as well. And for diabetes, we jump up to that one. Our big concerns are um, soluble in terms of restriction would be sometimes minimizing the fat and um, insoluble carbohydrates. Uh, whether we're talking about the dog or the cat, we do not want a lot of readily available glucose carbohydrates. And then finally, the pancreatitis um, it would fit under low fat diets. And of course, fat restriction is important. So, so I've given you a, a table to use um, for, your, um, for your patients from a nutrient restricted perspective. I've also given you a table of nutrient enriched diet options. And so, um, the nutrients that I think are important, key ones across disease states that would need to be enriched um, are listed up here on the top. And then again, the vertical axis has these diet categories similar to the previous slide or previous table. So again, for, um, for cardiac congestive heart failure, um, I would like the diet to be adequate and enriched in taurine. Um, and again, uh, fat is where the, all the calories are gonna come from. And um, one of the two uh, cardiac diets actually is increased in fat. And then um, making sure there's plenty of uh, N3 fatty acids, DEPA and DHA to help with um, the inflammation associated with um, the changes in cardiac um, function. And you can see that uh, in the, the, I guess the orange cover, colored rows or the, or the major concerns that we've listed for savory. And you can see again that for diabetes, all the feline diets are high in protein, which means they're gonna be high in phosphorus. Uh, the fat level varies on them for both canine and feline. Uh, there's gonna be a lot of complex carbs in all of the canine diabetic diets. Um, soluble fiber will also be part of the canine and feline diabetic diets. And all of them are enriched in EPA and DHA, which is absolutely, actually wonderful because diabetes is, a, is a, actually a condition of inflammation and oxidative stress. And um, nothing for the stones and in terms of increasing nutrients. And then finally, um, um, our, um, our pancreatitis. So, so here's two tables that you can use to try and identify where, what you're looking for in a diet based on um, based on the condition of the diet category, okay? And so the next step here is basically to cross-check those tables and see which diets um, uh, overlap your, your nutrients of interest, okay? And so if you do that, it takes a little bit of time and it may take more time than you actually have in practice. But if you have an interest, that would be one way to work this process. And if you did that, you would, um, your challenge would be met and you would have seen that the Royal Canin Hepatic Diet 
the Hill CD multi care, any senior life stage diet that's not a Purina diet, and the Royal Canin early care, um, um, early care um, cardiac diet would be uh, excellent choices. Okay, so let me introduce another table because again, um, the process sometimes I'm trying to what I'm trying to do is show you the ultimate process and then show you some short steps to try and decrease the amount of time it's gonna take you to identify um, the right diet for these multiple problems. So this is another table that I've given to you in your resource list. And this basically is looking at diet, uh, not diet categories, but, um, but disease conditions, okay? From uh, what, what the fat level should be in the diet, what the protein level should be in the diet, and what the phosphorus level should be in the diet. Certainly there are other nutrients of interest or concern for these disease states, but I find that these are the big ones, okay, for the short-term feeding for these conditions. And so you just kind of follow the grid around, right? So you can see that, just as an example, we can see that uh, renal disease, um, hepatic encephalopathy, and urolith and cardiac, um, we're looking for a diet that's, those, those um, disorders benefit from a high fat diet and a low protein diet. Um, and because the protein is low, that means that the phosphorus is gonna be low as well, okay? So you go in both directions and find out low phosphorus, goes along with low protein. And then for these disorders, we're looking for something that they're gonna get most of their calories from fat, okay? Another example um, would be uh, pancreatitis down here at the bottom. So for pancreatitis, we know we want a diet that's low in fat, okay? We want a diet that's moderate in protein, and because it's moderate in protein, the phosphorus level is likely gonna be high. It might be moderate to high, but it's not really a big concern with the pancreatitis, with pancreatitis in and of itself. And so um, that's how you use this grid. And actually um, it can really decrease the amount of time that you spend looking up things um, and um, can, can help you minimize your time doing that. Okay. so. Introduce, here we introduce another table that another resource for you. So now that we have three different resources to utilize, I want to do another case with you. Okay, so this is Tonka. And Tonka. Hey, Dr. Saker. Yeah. We actually have a question before we move on to this next case. Um, it's from Sarah Lash. Please discuss sure. dogs, cats with calcium oxalate. How is this being diagnosed without surgical removal? And I thought these cases needed mineral restriction, plus were higher in sodium to encourage drinking more water. Sure, sure. I will try and address that. So um, dogs and cats with calcium oxalate, yes, um, it, you cannot dissolve those types of uh, urolists or stones. You're absolutely right. And they need to be surgically removed, okay? But the goal with feeding is not to, uh, not to shrink or dissolve the stones, but to prevent um, either them getting bigger if you can't do surgery and they're not blocking the animal or to prevent the reoccurrence of them, okay? And so, um, so the mineral restriction is um, for calcium oxalate is actually old school. Um, we found uh, the original diet that was um, for the dog that was formulated for calcium oxalate restriction was Hills UD, which is extremely, extremely low in calcium, okay? Which would seem to make sense, right? We don't want there to be a lot of calcium in the diet, so there's not a lot of calcium in the urine, right? It's also restricted in oxalates, obviously. But what we found over time was that these dogs that were on UD and were prone to calcium oxalate kept getting calcium oxalate reoccurring, okay? If you think about it, the reason, the most logical reason is because as you restrict the dietary calcium, the body needs to maintain a circulating homeostasis for homeostatic level for calcium. It's gonna start pulling calcium from the bone, okay? Which is gonna result in over time in bone demineralization and 
um, calcium in the urine, okay? So you're not making any headway by restricting the calcium. Um, there is controversy still about what to do with the sodium. And um, if you look at the prescription diets for um, calcium oxalate or calcium oxalate sastruvite prevention, you'll see that they are in two different um, camps, okay? If you increase the sodium in the diet, the animal will drink more water, it will make the urine more dilute, and then it will, it will result in, in the calcium, any calcium that's in the urine and any oxalates that are in the urine, the urine is so dilute they can't find each other, okay? And so they can't combine and they can't precipitate. On the other hand, if you, um, if you um, decrease the sodium, then less calcium will end up um, in, the, in the urine because calcium follows sodium, okay? And so you can reduce the amount of calciuria that way. So, so whether it's Royal Canin or Hills or, or Purina with their, with their urolith diets for struvite calcium oxalate, they, they all have different sodium levels, okay? Um, I hope that answered your question without too much confusion. Thank you. Okay, um, cool. All right, so our next case again is Tonka, 10 and a half year old, male neutered um, orange tabby. Um, he weighs 3.2 kgs, his body condition score is low, his muscling is like, like, likewise low. <laughs> um, summarize his clinical concerns based on his going through his history, doing a physical exam, uh, again, reviewing his lab work and, um, and um, imaging uh, results. Tonka has um, had a megacolon, so he had a subtotal colectomy performed about three years ago. He has recurrent diarrhea, very soft to watery stools, and oftentimes he seems to be straining in the litter box during defecation. As you can see, he has a poor body condition score, a three out of nine. He has, um, he has suspected IBD or GI lymphoma, which is um, oftentimes the, the rule outs, the differentials, right, um, kind of go together. He also has been diagnosed recently with early stage renal disease. He happens to be dehydrated um, and he, um, by the way, he vomits several times a week um, that contain hair and some bile. Uh, let's see if I can get to the next slide. There we go. Some additional information that might be helpful for Tonka is that for uh, the past three years, um, since his um, since his megacolon surgery, he's been fed uh, Purina cat chow indoor diet, um, but he recently has been kind of turning his little nose up at it. And um, in regards to the concern for IBD or GI lymphoma, the owners are not interested in doing an intestinal biopsy. So at this point, um, these things are suspect maybe highly suspect. Okay, so putting it all together, if we make our list, going through that process, we make our list of, of major concerns, um, historical megacolon, uh, diarrhea, dehydrated, suspect IBD, GI lymphoma, and poor BCS, early stage one renal, he's a senior pet, he prefers dry diet, and he has intermittent hairball <laughs> expulsion. That's a pretty long list to work with. And, and if you go, if you do this, each one, you know, look at each one, it could take quite a while to figure out the best diet. Um, so our strategy here would be to, um, what two major medical categories can you as a veterinarian identify from Tonka's list of concerns? Okay, so that's a question I'm, I'm asking you guys. We'll go back to that list, all of these. Is there a way that you can you can identify two major um, kind of lumping together, right? Um, two major um, category, medical categories that we could work with here. So if you could just kind of uh, throw your answers in at the chat, we'll see what you come up with. Oops, sorry. I'm trigger happy here, even tr more trigger happy, okay. Any, any responses here so far? GI-related disease and kidney disease, okay. Um, Dr. Chavis wrote that one. Uh, potential maldigestion, malabsorption, okay, from Dr. Lash. Renal, IBD, mega colon from Dr. Katie. Hey, Dr. Katie. Um, 
and uh, renal GI. Okay, so you guys have the idea here. Um, and so, goodness, let's see. There we go. All right. So, so you guys are on the same um, wavelength as me. I was able to narrow these down um, to um, lumping together the megacolon, the diarrhea, the dehydration, the suspect IBD, GI lymphoma, and poor BCS into the gastrointestinal or GI category. And then the early stage renal and even perhaps the early senior pet into the renal category. I put a little one down there that prefers dry diet, but uh, <laughs> We're not gonna worry about that one right now. Let's start throw that in there. Okay, all right, so we have two major categories now. We've taken that long list of concerns and, and um, synthesized it down to something that's workable. All right, so now I'm gonna throw this table, not throw it, I'm gonna introduce this table again that I showed you just a little bit ago to see how we can use it to really, um, in a more time efficient manner, narrow down what we what we what we can find for this pet okay so the renal concern um we look right here for renal disease we want diets that are high in fat that are low to moderate in protein depending on um, the stage and that are low in phosphorus okay um for our gastrointestinal issues um if we're thinking about IBD um, concern and maybe um, novel or the protein source comes to mind for you, then I'm gonna, I'm gonna I would look at the categories of atopy or allergy. And uh, my creative little uh, lasso around here, um, you can see that that there's a kind of a range. Um, these diseases can be benefit from either low or moderate fat from. Um, either moderate or low protein, and I'm not really worried about the phosphorus that will just fall will it, where it may based on the protein level. And then finally, the diarrhea and um, the soft stool kind of thing, uh, I'm going to look at my gastrointestinal disease category where we have vomiting, diarrhea, and regurg as our major clinical signs. And here, again, a little bit of an overlap. We have um, these, these kind of disorders are best managed with diets that are low in fat across the board, um, either low or moderate protein. And again, I am not concerned about the phosphorus. So this kind of, I think, narrows it down. Um, and then the next step to the process would be um, choosing a diet um, based on table one, what nutrient profile do you think is best for, for Tonka in the short term? And what I mean by nutrient profile is, as you look at all these, which ones, um, which ones kind of overlap that we could compromise or if we have to prioritize to uh, choose the best diet, okay? So, um, so that's the next question I have for you. And that may take... Uh, Take a little bit of um, a little bit of time to think about. And I don't want to take up too much time here. So I am going to intervene and I'm going to throw my my thoughts out here. The diet that would be best for Tonka short term would be something that's low phosphorus for the renal issues, right? Low moderate protein hypoallergenic for the suspect IBD, soluble fiber sources for the renal as well as the diarrhea, uh, and low moderate fat for GI issues and diarrhea. Okay, now I'm asking you to go back to those other two tables to find the best or most appropriate diet options. Again, we can just focus right away on our restricted diet options nutrient restricted diet options for phosphorus. We want low phosphorus. These are our options uh, for our concerns that are highlighted in green. For a um, lower protein for the renal and IBD issues, these are our, um, our diet categories. And then for, we wanted lower fat um, for, our, our, um, for IBD and diarrhea issues. And these are our categories when we talk about our renal concerns for these animals, our um, IBD concerns, and our diarrhea concerns. 
So that really helps narrow down the, um, the, the diet options. And then if we look at something that we wanted enriched, we wanted, um, there are some, some of the concerns were for, um, uh, for low fat diets, for hypoallergenic, some of them are more moderate in protein. Um, and then we want an increased soluble fiber, nutrient increase, enriched in diet, soluble fiber for the diarrhea and the renal disease. And so we have some options here. So if we just kind of sketch that out uh, real quickly on a piece of scratch paper, we can see our low phosphorus is for our renal diets. We're gonna get it in our renal diets and our hypoallergenic diets, everything except this one here. Our low to moderate protein, we're gonna get from our early stage renal diets um, for the cat. And um, Tonka is a cat. We're gonna get low to moderate protein from our hypoallergenic diets, everything but this one here, which is very high in protein and our GI diets, except for EN low fat, which is very high in protein. Um, excuse me. Uh, if our low moderate fat, we're looking for um, just in general renal diets, uh, only, only, these, only this particular one for low to moderate fat or hypoallergenic diets, but not Royal Canin um, uh, hydrolyzed protein and our low GI fat diets, which we know very um, well at this point. GI low fat, Royal Canin GI low fat, Hills EN low fat, um, Hills ID low fat and Purina EN low fat. And then for our fi soluble fiber sources, these are the kind of diets that are gonna have um, more soluble fiber, all the hypoallergics except ZD. All right. So what matches best in all categories for Tonka the cat? Well, if you just take a look at that thing that you scratched out there, scratch down, you can see that the hypoallergenic diets are gonna be low in phosphorus. They're gonna be moderate to low in protein. <clears throat> They're gonna be low in fat, moderate to low in fat. And they're going to be um, they're going to be increased in soluble fiber sources. So that really helped narrow it down to hypoallergenic diets. And I do have some some exceptions here. So with all those problems, now we've gotten it down to one diet type for this cat. So the next part, the last step of this process, is to choose one or two appropriate diets. So my question to you then is, where does one find the whole list of hypoallergenic diets that are, of, that are not blue HF, are not royal canin HP, and are not ZD diet? Where do we find those? Okay. Um, I might have an answer here. Uh, oops, sorry. Where we find them, uh, again, in the, in the sake of time, we can use our product reference guides for that. We can contact the, the diet reps for that. You can, um, maybe Dr. Google can give you that information. Uh, and the, but maybe the easiest thing that you can do is to utilize this table that I've provided for you as another resource. And what it is, is a, an expanded table of, um, Prescription diets for small animals disease states. This is just a very small part of that table that has to do with that lists the hypoallergenic diets for the cat. Um, and here's the whole list of them. Okay. There's also a category that includes hypoallergenic diets um, that are called multifunction, and Royal Canin is the king or queen of those. Okay. So for this kitty, um, we don't want ZD, we don't want HP. We really would like a hydrolyzed diet. So that cuts out the DD and the, and the select protein ones. Um, <clears throat> we didn't look at Ultimino. It's not really um, in terms of, are we getting much, much benefit from that in terms of its price compared to Purina HA? No, so I think that Purina HA would be an appropriate choice if we wanted to try one of these uh, new um, Bengal multifunction diets, this Royal Canin renal support and hydrolyzed would be a good one. The problem for these diets can be that this cat, if the cat really likes canned food, that there may not be as many options. Okay, um, so another, another example of using the process, all right? 
Uh, let me see if I can get this slide. Um, so for to continue with these last steps, you choosing one or two appropriate diets based on going through the, those tables and algorithm. And then the next thing is to determine how much to start feeding. And um, we're going to calculate its daily energy requirements. This is the equation for that. Um, your DER factor list is in your resource packet. Once, you, once, you can, once you've used that DER factor, a single number, um, to get your kcals per day, to get your dose of feeding, how much to start feeding, your um, kcals per day divided by whatever the energy density of your chosen diet is, and that will give you your daily dose of food. And then finally, you want to consider how long to feed this diet um, or diets that you chose as options and what to monitor to ensure your diet choices um, are working for the patient. And again, this may be a two-phase thing, short-term, until you can get some of your um, multiple disease um, conditions under better control, and then perhaps more long-term may be a different feeding plan. I want to um, just follow up with um, a couple other uh, um, pieces of information, basically. And this is kind of going through what I think are the commonly identified morbidities. And these are just when there's two, okay? Before we were talking about more than two, here's just two. So some very common ones that, that we see, that I see in practice all the time are for the dog, the dog that comes in with both renal and pancreatitis. There's really only one diet on the market right now that would be um, restricted in phosphorus, restricted in protein or adjusted in protein, low in sodium, and low in fat for the pancreatitis, and that is Hill's GD diet. It also contains some soluble fibers. Um, another, another common um, comorbidity is urolis and obesity, okay? This one um, can be a little bit tricky, but um, because we need for our urolis, we need quite a bit of um, multiple mineral um, restriction, but Royal Canin has a multifunction diet called SO, and satiety that works quite well for that. How about obesity and IBD or allergies? That's a pretty common one we see as well. Um, again, we're looking for something for obesity that's high protein, low fat. It would be best if there was insoluble fiber in it. For IBD allergies, you know, we work, we're interested in the protein source. We don't want the fat to be particularly high it would be better if it was a lower fat. So we have a couple really standard options here would be Royal Canin, Satiety and Hydrolyzed, and then the blue HF diet and the HF stands for Hydrolyzed Fish. Those are your two best options for go-tos. Another one, uh, one for the cat, diabetes and renal disease is fairly commonly seen um, in our practice at the vet school as well. And here we're looking for um, here we're going to have to <laughs> going to have to kind of um, compromise. Um, this, this is not quite as clear cut as some of these as these other three here. Okay, so for diabetes, we're looking for something that's higher in in protein and low in carbohydrates. Okay, for the cat. For renal disease, we're looking for restricted phosphorus and adjusted protein. Right. And so if we look at all our diet categories, we're going to have to, I'm sorry, uh, we're going to have to compromise because renal, we need really high, really, we want to, we're going to restrict the proteins and the phosphorus in diabetes. We're going to increase the protein as high as we can. So now we're looking for something that's in the middle, middle of the road, all right? And both of them can benefit from the N3 fatty acid content and uh, hypoallergenic diets. Again, um, there are other diets that might have a moderate protein, but um, these hypoallergenic diets have a lower phosphorus. So that would help more, be more beneficial for the renal aspect of this cat's problems. Okay, um, others that might come to mind, I don't know, um, we're sort of, um, sort of at the end of our, our time here, but if you have any others that you want to throw into the chat right away or 
question. Yeah, we, we do have one to... question. It says, what about cats with chronic low-grade pancreatitis and early renal disease? Okay. That one is an interesting one. Um, I'm going to start with the early, early renal disease. The first thing whenever I hear renal disease, whether it's stage one, stage two, stage three, or stage four, the first thing I want to focus on is lowering the dietary phosphorus level. Okay. The best way to do that, the best way to do that is to um, choose a diet that's got, that is not super high in protein. Okay. So, um, so now I'm looking for a diet that's either lower or moderate in protein. I'm looking for one that definitely has lower sodium content. For the low-grade pancreatitis, you know, how do we approach that? Um, I don't want to, I don't necessarily want there to be a lot of omega-3 fatty acids in there right away. Um, the low-grade pancreatitis, I you know, I want something that's highly digestible. So that would be one that's low in fiber, which would also be a renal diet. And, um, you know, would it benefit these animals to have something that's uh, more of a novel protein? I, you know, that's questionable as well. So what I would go for initially for that kind of a problem is I would go for an early stage renal diet for the cat. And that would be either um, Purina NF early care or Hills KD early support. I think both of those would have a profile that should work for the, um, for the cat. Interestingly, the cat that has pancreatitis, we don't worry about the fat level as much as we do in the dog. And so those two renal diets, um, I would choose the one that had the lower fat content of the two. If that didn't work for me and, the, and we felt the fat content was still too high, the other one that I would think about, to be honest with you, would be um, Hills HA, feline HA diet, which is a, is a dry hypoallergenic diet that has lower phosphorus. Um, it has adjusted protein in it and, um, and um, it's gonna be a lower fat diet. So that would be a, a go-to option. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question? I think so. <laughs> All right. I have um, another case here, but <clears throat> in, um, in the, in the um, interest of time, I'm not gonna go through that case. I will have my um, slide set available and so I will, uh, you'll be able to read through that case on your own and kind of see what your thought process is and compare it to, to my um, idea of choosing a diet based on using this process, the, the expedited version of this process um, and see how you, how you fare with that. Um, what else do I have here? Let me just get through the last ones. By the way, the case is happens to be a young puppy with a portosystemic shunt. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, I think I'll end there so that I don't run over time. And I certainly um, thank all of you very much for your interest. I'm happy to answer any questions now or down the road. Uh, you're more than welcome to contact our um, nutrition service. Uh, to ask questions. Any questions that we have from referring veterinarians are um, free of charge for our answer. And uh, that doesn't mean that the answer is any less, um, any less valuable than if we charge you something for it, but that's just uh, our policy. So, um, so um, please don't be shy about, about contacting us through our um, nutrition service email and uh, to ask us, ask us any questions that you might have. Dr. Saker, thank you so much for your time and all your valuable information. We will be sending a CE certificate out to the attendees along with a copy of um, the PowerPoint. That way they can kind of review everything that you've gone over tonight. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you all for your, um, for your attention. And thank you Vets Pets for the opportunity to, to chat with everybody and share some info. Have a good evening. Bye.
And for those that are still on, um, August 31st, we will be having Parvo, an update with Dr. Catherine Roulard. Um, it is a talk that I've heard and it's very informative and very helpful for uh, something that doesn't seem to be going away in our area. So hope to see you guys then. Thank you so much.